Hi there, it's David Gardner. Um, I thought I'd do an extra recording just to redo uh, the demo that didn't work out in our recent recording on Azure Functions uh, from my presentation. Uh, turns out when you switch uh, laptops just before you do a demo, uh, not everything may work as planned. So I'm back on the laptop that's got everything that I need to do the demo. So let's jump in. So uh, we'll skip over back to the part where we got up to uh, just before the, the demo that didn't work before. Uh, so we're talking about adding open API support to Azure Functions. And just to recap, uh, you can do that out of the box if you're using the latest versions of Visual Studio, creating a new as a Azure Function project um, and then choosing the HTTP trigger with open API option. Alternatively, uh, you can for an existing Azure Function project, uh, just add a reference to the NuGet package microsoft.azure.webjobs.extensions.openapi. But let's jump in and have a look at a demo. So I'm going to launch Visual Studio 2022 and open up my demo solution. And we'll have a look at a .NET 5 Azure Function project. And I've already added the reference to that package and I've already started adding in the uh, extra functionality for that. So let's have a look at the trigger. And so here's our HTTP trigger. We've got uh, a few attributes that have been added to this uh, function. First of all, we've got the open API operation where we indicate the operation ID and we can also add some extra tags to this operation and then we can provide a summary and a description to help document uh, what this endpoint is doing. We can then indicate uh, when we are requesting or posting to this endpoint in this case uh, what is the kind of data structure that is going to be sent to it, what is it expecting. So it's expecting JSON and the actual structure of that data uh, should map to this type. So if we drill into that, we'll see we've got a class here and so that JSON will be deserialized back to this type and we've got some properties on this class. We've got name, age and nullable string and each of those have got uh, an open API attribute applied to them and so for some of these we've used the description to help document what each uh, property is about. We can also indicate whether a property um, should allow nulls or not through the, the open API spec. So with this property uh, does actually have a, a nullable reference type here. Um, but uh, the extension, open API extension, uh, needs to be backwards compatible with uh, earlier versions of C Sharp. So uh, hence we're going to use the attribute to indicate that. Um, and then we can also indicate what the default value might be for a property. And we can also use some of the data annotation attributes that you might be already familiar with, like max length or range, uh, to also provide extra information about the properties. The other thing we've got up here is the open API example attribute, and that references this other class, info request example. Let's have a look at that. So this class inherits from a base class. And this is a way of providing sample data uh, for these types. So we're creating an instance of info request and then we're setting some example properties here with some values there. And that will actually get used uh, with the open API uh, generation. But one last thing we've had to do is in the program class in the main method, we've added in a call to configure open API. So if we've uh, done that, we'll jump back to the trigger and uh, we've got two more attributes here just to, to go through. Uh, that was the request side of things. So when the uh, endpoint uh, returns back a result, uh, first of all, we might have a, a 200 result. Everything's okay. And we're going to respond with a body and it's just going to be a, a string response. The second uh, return type that we've documented here for open API is that we may have a response that doesn't have a body and it's going to be a 400 bad request and we've just added a description to indicate what that might mean if we get a 400 out of this endpoint. Okay, so we've got everything in place now. We can press F5 and we're going to build and debug our 
function. So it's now running. I'm just going to grab that URL, bring my browser onto my screen, paste that URL in, and here is our um, open API, our Swagger document uh, with a web interface to it. So we can expand out our endpoint there. We can see the example data that we provided is being used here and, and demonstrated to the end user. We didn't provide an example of what the response might be, um, so it's just given us the type there. And we can actually try out this endpoint. So by default, it's going to use the example data that uh, we were given. Hit on execute and there's our response coming back from that function right there. So that's all working really nicely. We can even dig in, have a look at the actual uh, swagger.json file. Uh, so this is version 2 of the open API spec. And we've got our data there and some of our um, types are coming through here. Uh, that's all looking pretty good. Okay, so that's version 2. What about if we wanted to produce a version 3 of the Open API? Well, let's stop debugging. We'll go over to this other class. We've got Open API configuration options. I'm going to uncomment that. This implements uh, an interface, and this will get uh, noticed if it exists. And this allows us to set a number of properties, uh, including being able to set uh, some extra metadata for the whole um, function itself, so like title and description and some contact and license details. Um, if there's an internal version number for, for this version of our endpoint, then we can indicate that there. And we also have the ability to set the open API version, so by default it generates version 2. Uh, we're now going to say actually we want version 3. So if we hit F5 again to build and run locally our function, compiling it and it should start up any second. Here it goes. Using the core tools we've got our same URL again. I'll switch back to my browser and I'll refresh and we should see a bit more information here at the top. There we go. So we've got our extra metadata there in our description and everything else looks pretty similar here. If we switch over to that swagger.json view and refresh that we'll see we're actually getting extra metadata here as well our open API version has changed to 301 um, and that's all there so just something else to point out um, the example data that we talked about earlier that's coming through in the the swagger document here but it is coming through as a string not not as a JSON blob um, and that's actually because a library that the open API extension depends on hasn't actually implemented uh, anything more than being able to store a string here. So just be uh, aware of that if you're going to point this Swagger file at another tool like Postman or uh, similar, that if they try and use the example data, you're going to have to uh, do a little bit of manual unescaping this to turn it back into proper JSON. It obviously looks fine in the browser view here, um, but Yes, you just have to be aware of that. Um, just watch out for that one. Hopefully that um, sort of upstream library gets uh, updated at some stage to support um, proper JSON embedding here, and then you won't have to worry about that. But uh, for, for the moment, that's just how that is. Okay, and so that's all running properly now. We'll go back to our slide. So, uh, just uh, summarising that, we saw just adding that uh, reference to OpenAPI uh, and using those attributes uh, lets us build and publish our OpenAPI sort of Swagger documents for our Azure functions. So, with that, thanks for, for watching and hope you'll join us again soon for more presentations from the Adelaide.NET user group.